Hello and welcome to video number two of Beyond Fun. On our previous video we talked about the psychological needs of people and how meeting those needs can increase the quality of fun. Here we're going to talk about the longevity of campaigns, the type of fun that we keep coming back to get more of. More and more I see <clears throat> people who keep their campaigns alive by having you know, gimmicky mini games at the carnival between sessions or just running one shot after one shot after one shot. And I see people who want to play in longer campaigns that continue to have meaning over time. And so we're going to talk about how to maintain campaign longevity. I have four things on my list of things that are needed in the system for the campaign to have longevity. These are things that are on my list primarily because I noticed them lacking in Mindweave when I started running a Mindweave campaign that has lasted, oh, four or five years now, I don't remember. And so I had to add these things in in order to to get that longevity. Over time we started to see, oh, this is missing, this is missing. So the first thing I have is permanent character death. I add the word permanent because It's, it's often the case that there's character death, but it's easy to, to bring back and it doesn't really mean anything. But character death is important because uh, for the longevity of a campaign, it's important that, that you are cycling characters, right? You can't have an infinite length campaign while having the same set of characters forever because eventually those characters are topping out and wanting to go on to something else. And the campaign ends if you haven't been able to cycle things in. And that permanent death means that there has to be a way to cycle people in. It also means that there's real consequences for actions. And that, that high levels of foolishness will lead to the ultimate cost for the character. Um, second on my list, I have high level retirement play. Sometimes this is called domaining. So this is where as a character reaches a high level, they can retire out of out of active adventuring so that you can replace so that you can be cycling these characters in all the time and they can be having an impact on the campaign world at a high level after they've gone into retirement from from the main adventuring play and this is vitally important for a campaign to continue to last because the players the really active players can continue to have new ways to contribute to the campaign that structurally raise the world up rather than just being random gimmicks. Uh, next on my list, I have the value of information. It's amazing how many adventures can be driven by making it hard to learn things. So finding a wand and not knowing the command word and having to go search for that command word, seek out a specific sage who knows more about wands. Uh, this was something that was really lacking in Mindweave because there were no command words on magic items. They were all very systematic and, and clear. And so ha I had to insert it in other ways, but it, that really added to the longevity and to the, the player autonomy and player goals of the campaign was having things that they wanted to learn more about, mysteries that they ran into that couldn't just be solved by asking or by casting a spell. And then finally, the integration of NPCs. Here I'm talking primarily about henchmen, but also hirelings. It's vitally important for the campaign to, to continue to grow and, and have this longevity for there to be characters other than the PCs who matter a lot and who have an impact on, on the world so that it builds this connection through the, P, the from the PCs, through these NPCs to the rest of the world. Um, that makes the world um, alive for the players. And so those are the four main mechanical things that I've noticed missing in Mindweave and, and missing in other systems that make it hard for campaigns to have this longevity because they're just not connected to the world in a way that allows the world to grow. But let's talk about some cultural needs because I think culture is probably more important than system for making this type of thing happen. And so for cultural needs, I'm going to call upon Rick Stump's, um, what he calls psychotronic gaming. I'm going to use his list verbatim and just talk about each one a little bit. So the first thing you need is strict timekeeping. Uh, the, the culture of strict timekeeping means that the, everything that you're doing has consequences, even if you're just in the town where it's safe, because time is passing. 
the goblin king is gathering his forces the cult is raising more and more undead and so that strict timekeeping means that all of the choices made in the campaign matter even when they're not choices that result in immediate danger next is verisimilitude yes it's a fantasy game yes there's magic and all kinds of crazy things can happen but it all has to make internal sense within the world the magic works in a specific way and so things that break that magic rule break the verisimilitude yes magic can do these amazing things what consequences will that have on the rest of the world and so that verisimilitude is important so that just the mechanics of the game even cascade into consequences that are real and meaningful in the world so that the world can continue to progress and, and have this longevity there should always be logical consequences next he says that status quo is the enemy and what this means is that everything is constantly changing uh, even if the players aren't the ones driving that change although quite often they are uh, even if the, the players have gone off and ignored a certain aspect of the campaign world that aspect of the campaign world should continue to evolve the goblin king I mentioned the players don't go confront him he continues to build his forces he wipes out the dwarven stronghold that the players have visited before and when they come back the world shouldn't be the same as when they left it status quo is the enemy next is multiple characters per player I'll admit that certain systems are, are easier to do this with than others, but I still think this is a cultural question. The idea of having the one one party campaign where this party is the party we're with all the time and they advance to the end of the campaign, that means the campaign has an end. Having multiple characters per player means that you're constantly cycling those things out and you're not as exposed to the, the interruptions of real life. If a player can't make it one week, that's okay. Everyone else has has their characters that they can add into the cast. And if those char the people who can play more often start to advance a little bit faster than the, the people who are playing less often, they'll soon have lower level characters coming into the campaign who will catch up with those players who play less and all everyone will continue to have parties that can work together. It also means that the players who are playing a lot are constantly inserting new characters into the campaign who are able to form parties that can be joined by new players that you're bringing in. So as you have players who, due to the, the chaos of life, can't play, stop being able to play, they can always be replaced with other players because it's not one campaign about one party. It's an ongoing story of many, many parties, which affords the opportunity to keep bringing people in and to, keep, to have people who can't play very often continue to keep up even though they're not playing very often. And so multiple characters per player solves many, many problems that can be the death of campaigns. The next thing is that it's important that characters can win or lose. <clears throat> we talked about this a little bit with autonomy and competence um, in the psychological needs of games. But the ability for characters to win and lose means that they're not just constantly winning and, and getting ahead and, and the campaign becomes stale and more importantly, they run out of things to overcome. The ability to, to lose means that there's going to be setbacks from time to time. Think about your favorite long-running TV shows. Like I think about Stargate. Constantly, you would say, oh, yes, they, they had this victory. And then in the very next episode, they would lose. Um, in Stargate, it's the zero-point modules, right? They would find two, and then, oh, well, we lost three. And it was always one step forward, two steps back. And that meant that there was always something to be to have continue happening right it was oh we won this victory oh but we awakened this great evil and so the ability for the players to win and lose naturally introduces that one step forward two steps back that makes the campaign continue to to be alive and not just a constant escalation to the next big thing where they have to save the world and then save the world again and save the world again and then destroy the aliens that are invading and then save the universe it means that, that the play can still continue within a reasonable, sustainable level. Next is that players drive action. And this is, this is culturally 
absolutely the most important thing is that the GM isn't the one telling the players where the story is, right? He's not saying these are the events that are going on and we're going to walk through these events one at a time. No, the players are looking at the world that the Dungeon Master has created and saying, that's interesting, I would like to engage with that. They're driving the action. They're setting goals for their characters and those goals are are um, pulling them along to, to the next tasks. And the Dungeon Master is providing a world in which those goals can be pursued. But the players drive that action. And that makes it so that the Dungeon Master doesn't have to have a plan with a beginning and a middle and end. And so it goes on forever and ever and ever because players are always going to be able to think of new goals. Even with one character, they think of more new goals. But remember, we have multiple characters. And so there's more goals and more goals and more goals. And it just continues to build upon itself. And the last one, and this is where Rick gets the psych uh, psychotronic gaming um, tag from is that genre is descriptive not proscriptive meaning that you can always bring in concepts from a sci-fi book that you're reading or or from any other genre to make the world have greater variety and i never would have thought that i would be interested in having sci-fi components in my fantasy campaign but as i've run these long-term campaigns i've realized eventually you always end up wanting to go into outer space and so it just makes sense early on to be introducing the idea that there's more to the world than than just a, a bland fantasy setting, that there's other things coming in that don't necessarily fit into the fantasy genre because genre is descriptive, not proscriptive. It's largely fantasy, but there's nothing that is left off the table. And that gives you opportun new opportunities to just have so much more richness. Uh, and, and other things that can keep being introduced into the campaign so that it allows it to be a, uh, a very long-lived thing. And I know that longevity in a campaign isn't necessarily what everyone is looking for. But if you're looking to have, have fun for a long, long period of time, this is really the, the things that, that can contribute to that. Thanks for watching.